Hi, I'm Camille Vasca. Welcome to our Monday Supper, where we talk about the important issues in this important election year. And of course, my husband Mike's Attorney General campaign. Today, we'll be talking about how we can safely get our children back in school during the COVID-19 pandemic. Both our sons went to public school here in Issaquah. We know so many parents who are really concerned about children falling behind because they can't go back to school. Our first guest tonight is candidate for governor, Dr. Raul Garcia. He'll outline his strategy for getting our kids back in school this year in a way that follows science and is safe for our teachers and our children. Mike and Dr. Garcia were featured recently in a very flattering column in the Washington Times, written by a former assistant director to the president. He wrote about how their immigrant stories and professional competency are important messages for the voters to hear. We'll take a few questions for Dr. Garcia, and then we'll be joined by friend of the show, Joel Ard, who's a former law partner of Mike's, and Lieutenant Governor candidate, Ann Davison Sattler. Now, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Camille. Is everyone as hot as I am? We do not have air conditioning uh, in our house. Uh, so hopefully the heat will pass soon. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Dr. Raul Garcia, who is one of our top Republican candidates for governor. He's the only medical doctor in the field, which in addition to showing his high level of qualifications and competence, gives him a very unique set of skills to address the challenges of COVID-19. The question of whether schools should open this fall is a policy question, of course, but it is also a question for the Attorney General as it will most likely generate lawsuits against the state. That has already happened in California where the governor and the Attorney General have been sued for their role in keeping schools closed. And of course, we'll hear later in the show from my old friend, Joel Ard, about his lawsuit against Washington State on this subject. But if our state gets it right, maybe we can avoid more litigation. That's the first job of a lawyer and our attorney general. I've got a lot of important questions to cover today, so let's get going. Oh, and if you have questions for Dr. Garcia, please post them on the Facebook feed or in the comments on our website, www.mikebasca.com. Before we get into your back to school plan, Dr. Garcia, by the way, are, are, you, are you there with us, Dr. Garcia? I am, I am, thank you. Oh, great, good to hear your voice. Um, before we get into your plan, you have a refugee story that sounds a bit like my father's. To summarize his, my grandfather's farm was taken by the communists in the Soviet Union. My dad was taken from his family by the Nazis as a young boy to serve as forced labor. And then he came to this country as a young teenager and a refugee, but only after escaping from being sent to Stalin's concentration camps. Can you tell us a little bit about your refugee story? Yeah, well, uh, thank you everybody for letting me have this time to speak on this important topic. I came from Cuba and like Mike, um, my grandfather's farm was taken by the government, was taken by Fidel Castro, our communist dictator at the time, and they came to my grandfather's land, would have, had a big tobacco plantation and a dairy farm, and both were all of a sudden state property. So all the love and hard work and sweat and tears that he had on his work was gone in one second. My mother had a school. She was a teacher. And they asked her to become a member of the Communist Party. And because she denied that, they took her school and they took her license. My uncle was found with a weapon. And because our right to bear arms was taken away in Cuba, him and his five friends that were found without weapon were put in jail. He almost died. His friends were not so lucky. They were killed by a firing squad. Um, that was my experience in Cuba and being raised as a communist pioneer. That's what they called us. Uh, I remember a story when we were in fourth grade, they asked us all to put our heads down and ask God for candy. And obviously candy wasn't there when we put our heads back up. And then they said, okay, well, why don't you ask Fidel Castro, our, co our 
government for candy and miraculously candy appeared on every desk. And the teacher said, this is how you understand that uh, your only God is government. So that is my experience. Um, that is very similar to yours, Mike, and uh, glad to share it. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. For me, these family stories remind us of how lucky we are to be citizens of a free country, that the rule of law is what protects our freedoms, and how dangerous it is to our liberty when a country is overrun by political extremes. How do you connect your refugee story with the issues facing our state today? Well, Mike, I, I know what big government is. We have the largest government ever in the history of Washington. And I'm in the race because I saw one branch of government want to rule and dictate and mandate without any checks and balances. That reminds me a lot of where I came from. That reminds me a lot of a government that slowly is taking our liberties away and that is selling government dependence, an idea of government dependence uh, that I believe if we let them be uh, successful, we will be in the abyss. Okay, well, uh, let's turn now to your, um, I'll call it back to school strategy, you may have a different name for it. But uh, let me start by mentioning you have an impressive resume in the field of medicine. How does that shape your approach to finding a common sense plan to getting our kids back in school this fall? Well, in medicine, uh, largely we rely on scientific data and scientific facts to make decisions, to find solutions in medicine. And I believe that right now what we have lacked as a government is to educate our public enough to make our own decisions. So as a new government, what our goal is to educate, and we would use the same ideology, using scientific facts to make sure that our local districts get educated as to school openings and make the right decisions using the right resources. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that. And, and before we dive into the details of your strategy, uh, including how we keep children and teachers safe when we reopen schools, can you give us kind of a high level summary of your strategy for reopening schools this fall? Sure. Well, six points uh, that will be key. Um, we need local control of this decision. This is not a one size fits all answer. So we need our local districts to have control of the decisions and they will involve teachers and administrators and parents in that decision. Number two, we need community partnerships Sometimes the decisions and solutions that we find are bound by what we have as structures in our schools. Finding community partners, and we will get more into this, um, will enable us to make sure that our solutions can be broader and that we could think outside the box and have in innovations. Number three, we need uh, to listen to our teachers. Teachers are vital and largely why we have rolled this out, listening to teachers all over the state um, have got us to this point. Teachers are the ones that are with the students every day and have a clear picture of what really happens inside the classroom. Number four is protecting our most vulnerable and that has to be a priority. That might be number one actually because we didn't do that on, in this pandemic. Protecting the most vulnerable, which may be older teachers or teachers that have vulnerable pre-existing conditions like lung disease or heart disease or diabetes, as well as administrators, as well as other students that may be vulnerable, we need to protect those. Number five, we are gonna deploy, deploy distance and uh, protections, right? In, our, in my hospital, 
we up the level of safety because we want people to feel safe when they come to the hospital. This virus, even though it's not out in the environment, we in, in the hospital protect ourselves as if it was. So in our schools, we may not need to go to the level of hospitals, but we need to take the extra steps to make sure that our children are safe. And finally, the last point is that we need to divide this going back to school strategy by age. We understand that children 10 or under rarely get the virus, rarely transmit the virus, and are not carriers of the virus. So basically our safest population that we need the least requirements on. Those are the six uh, points. I'm sure we, we will go more into them. Uh, yes, we will in just a minute, but I want to remind uh, those of you watching, if you have questions, post them on our Facebook feed or on our website at www.mikebasket.com. Now, we all know how important schools are to helping young children achieve success in life. You've talked about schools being part of the melting pot of America, not just educating our kids, but helping to create citizens for shared values. But I want to ask you about the scientific reports coming out from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, from pediatrician groups, and from bodies like the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, all of which warn of the harm that will come to our children if they are not allowed back in school this fall. What is your takeaway from these very alarming reports about the harm to kids if schools don't reopen? It's gonna be very detrimental, Mike. I wanna say that um, to start off, I, I talked about those six points, but this is the start of a conversation and I would like your input. So you saying, please have questions for Dr. Garcia. Uh, certainly is what we want to accomplish here, as we have done in our campaign, is say that government shouldn't mandate. Government should actually educate people. And that's what we're doing here, providing the data behind uh, this strategy with scientific facts so people can see the reality. There are a lot of things in here that I thought opposite to and, and that we'll, we'll talk about. but. This is something that's really important, what you asked. Uh, the American Association of Pediatrics has consistently come out in defense of getting our children back to school. If we even divide the children in an age group, as we uh, talked about, those younger children need that human interaction for their development. And I'm going to tell you that I am not a developmental uh, master in, in my area of medicine, but I have read a lot and it is overwhelming how detrimental it will be if we do not get our kids back to school, especially those low socioeconomic kids that depend on a meal, not only the human interaction, but they may not have the facilities or the equipment at home to have distance learning. Now, um, one of the concerns about reopening the schools comes from teachers, especially those who are older and in the age groups more vulnerable to dying from COVID-19. How do you propose to address that very, very significant concern? Yeah, this is really important. Um, you know, parents are afraid of their kids contracting the virus and teachers are afraid of the kids giving them the virus. Uh, especially those vulnerable teachers. And those vulnerable teachers and administrators may be the ones that have innovative examples brought to them to see what they choose. For example, a vulnerable teacher may teach from her home, but still have a classroom with another licensed teacher there to support her in what her knowledge is. Other teachers may just find it easier for them to do uh, virtual learning with those students that parents choose to not bring, bring back to school, as we said, is not one solution fits all. And we have to put out options for everyone. There will be parents that are still going to fear sending their kids back to school. Okay, uh, let me ask you about one more fear that people have the fear that reopening schools this fall will spread the disease 
more widely into the community. Have we learned anything about that particular issue from other countries in Europe or maybe elsewhere that have reopened their schools so far? Yes, Mike, we actually have done a lot of research in all the reopenings that have been done all over the world. And the case is uh, what we are stating, that the youngest, excuse me for that. We, we, we can't have one of these live streams without uh, an unexpected interruption or it wouldn't of be course, fun. Of course, I, I, was, I was picturing my daughter coming to Anyway, um, so uh, we were on, on and the overwhelming data out there, you know, and, and you will see the whole the whole package. I think we, we sent you a, a draft of it. Um, school transmission of the virus is less than 10 percent as compared to workplaces, as, as compared to the community. This is consistent uh, all over the world and specific studies that have been done as I said before, have shown that children are the safest population to be carriers and transmit this virus. So this is sitting on solid ground. The data that we are showing are, is from scientific studies that show that children are not the population that we need to be worried about. Now, uh, as a reminder, if you're if you're watching or listening, if you have questions for Dr. Garcia, uh, post them on our Facebook page or on our web page. Uh, you can watch the video there as well uh, at www.mikebasket.com. Uh, um, I want to talk about the specifics of your strategy in a minute, starting with having local school boards, not the state, make the decision about reopening. But before I ask you about this, Dr. Garcia. Let me bring in my former law partner, Joel Ard, whose lawsuit may have nudged the may have nudged Governor Inslee to give local school districts control over this decision, at least for now. Joel, are you with us? I hope I am, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, you're wearing your festive uh, warm weather shirt, not one that it I- It seemed like summer, so I thought I'd put on my Hawaiian shirt. But the cherry blossoms are still out, Joel. So that's right. Update that. Uh, so, Joel, when we had you on the show, I think it was back in April, you had just filed a lawsuit on behalf of parents of school aged children against Governor Inslee and the stay at home order. Tell us why you think it helped convince Governor Inslee to take a different approach than some states, like California, which is not letting local school districts decide whether or not to reopen. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And and I, you know, as Dr. Garcia said, we think this is uh, very much a decision that needs to be made in, in local school districts. And a school district in Pendleray County might have different issues than one in King County. And that was largely the point of our lawsuit. Governor Inslee had issued a statewide order uh, mandating that all schools be closed uh, without any regard for what local conditions were like. Uh, and our lawsuit said that that violates the state constitutional mandate uh, that the state, Washington state as an entity, uh, provide an ample education to all children within its borders. And of course, every level of government in the state is responsible for executing that mandate, be it the executive branch or the, the judicial branch or the legislature. Um, we uh, did not get a decision on the question but very shortly before the uh, school shutdown order expired, the first school shutdown order expired, uh, the governor declined to extend it. Uh, he had a, a working group of a couple hundred people trying to figure out how to make rules to uh, reopen schools. And in conversations with some people who were involved in that working group, uh, they were very surprised how quickly the, uh, the rules came out. And they came out just before uh, we would have had a hearing on our shutdown order. And it, it mooted the case. That means that once the, if you challenge an order and the order expires, uh, your case is over. Uh, and we didn't get to have a hearing in front of a judge about that order. On the other hand, there is no statewide order shutting down the schools. And that's what we were hoping for. And that's what we got. Um, 
there are certainly concerns about the rules. Dr. Garcia has uh, expressed a number of those. Uh, they may be too restrictive, but they are put on local school districts. So it is up to your local school district at this point to decide what are the circumstances for us and for our students and for our teachers in our county. Uh, and that's the outcome we were looking for when we filed the lawsuit to say, you know, a local school district in Yakima might have different issues than a school district in uh, Chelan County or Penderay County, and they should make their own decisions uh, based on, you know, what the outbreaks of the virus are around them and what their medical facilities are like and the, the age and circumstances of the teachers they have. So we were really thrilled that uh, the governor did not extend a statewide order that the responsibility at this point is on your local school district. And if you don't like what the school district is doing, hey, join the PTA. So I think what I hear you, you saying, Joel, is you, you're gonna count that as a win. Um, Absolutely. Let me ask you, yes, of course, you take it when you can. Um, is there any reason why Governor Inslee couldn't uh, basically change his mind on this and reassert the state's authority to decide whether schools should open in the fall? Uh, as a practical matter, I think he could issue such an order. As a matter of law, I think that would in fact be wrong. I think you and, and Dr. Garcia have both pointed that out, that uh, distance learning uh, may be a stopgap, but it is not an ample education. Um, I think so many parents in the state who experience that distance learning uh, really got a, a, a immediate exposure to exactly what kind of great work our teachers do in Washington State and how important it is for their kids, their students to be in school, in the classroom, in front of Washington's great teachers. It's not an ample education to try to duplicate that uh, by Zoom or you know, Google Classroom or whatever other uh, stop gaps were put in place. And the constitutional mandate in the state of Washington is that the state make ample provision for education for all students within its borders. I think we saw very clearly uh, distance learning is lar largely not that ample education. We've got to get kids back in schools in front of their fantastically high quality teachers who are ready to teach them. So if he does try to shut them down again, hey, we're raring to go. Spoken like a lawyer and someone that has kids in public schools. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you Joel Ard, Ard and my former law partner. Now, my back great to Dr. Pleasure. Garcia, uh, you've outlined a six part strategy for reopening our schools in the fall. One, local control over the decision. Two, community partnerships to find space and resources. I think three, you said consult with teachers. Four, protecting the vulnerable, especially teachers five distancing and six making age distinctions. I hope I got those right. I only had a yes, chance yes. to look at your, your draft report today. Yes. Um, so now I wanna ask you um, about the first two of those, which is, uh, we'll lump them together. Maybe they shouldn't be, but um, you can answer the way you think is appropriate. Uh, the first two would be local control, you know, that we just talked about with Joel Ard, and then community partnerships. And I guess my question is, have you talked to local school boards or, or teachers yet about these? And if so, what are you, uh, what are you hearing? Absolutely, Mike. And, and I want to thank Joel first because uh, he set it up so, so this strategy could come out. Uh, I think that uh, school districts have until the middle of August to uh, bring out their decisions and what the solutions are. So I think that this is prime time to bring a, strat a strategy like this uh, in order um, for them to do that. But I, I got to thank Joel with his lawsuit for opening up the opportunity to even do that. So uh, thank you for that. The two uh, first points of our uh, strategy is local control and finding community partners. And the reason why that is important, yes, to answer your question, yes, I have spoken with a lot of administrators and teachers. And I can tell you one thing, they are all in to help students and to help teach. They really 
will be uh, behind this strategy because it opens it up for our local administrators and teachers and parents to work together for a solution. Bringing in community um, leaders, uh, community partnerships to this opens up our chances of creating wider solutions. For example, the um, kids older than 10 have a higher risk of transmission, even though it is really minimal compared to the adults. And when you read the whole document, you'll see all the data there that's very well delineated. Um, we can have school at churches, at restaurants um, that have been closed by this pandemic, uh, at other places of worship, at uh, gymnasiums, at boys and girls clubs. And when we bring those partners to get together with the school system, then we could have better solutions that are wider range and we could provide not only more places for these students to distance, for example, but also resources that the school system itself uh, wasn't counting on before. We've talked uh, a little bit about the potential risks to children and teachers from the spread of COVID-19 if they return to school this fall. How does your strategy deal with that concern? Well, um, I will give you something that was alarming to me in a good way. We thought in the medical profession that the transmission of COVID-19 was going to follow influenza or RSV. In the fall, influenza and RSV are huge and, and uh, we try to push for our children to be safe. This is not the case with COVID-19. It's quite the opposite. COVID-19 does not affect children the same way as other respiratory viruses. Uh, so this was really peculiar and something that, that blew my mind because we had the answer right in front of us. This is our safest population. So going back to the vulnerability of teachers and administrators and even other children that have pre-existing conditions, we do have to pay a good amount of time to finding solutions that are focused towards them. And I think I saw in your draft plan, uh, what I thought was a very innovative, when I say plan, I shouldn't have said that, uh, strategy, yeah. a very um, innovative suggestion, maybe an out of the box idea, but that's what you do when you're strategizing, that, um, that would have perhaps older, older teachers, maybe I should say wiser teachers, um, uh, teaching by video, so they'd be on the video screen while the kids would be in, in the room distance and not taking all the precautions, maybe with a younger, much younger teacher's assistant, which many of the schools have these days. Um, is that something that, is that kind of an idea that's just kind of out of the box or is that something? That's yeah, no, no, to... this is this is an idea that we're, we're gonna throw out there and um, have the local community respond to it and see if we have obviously enough teachers to go around to do that, one from home, one from the classroom. Uh, but the, the point of it is, is let's think outside the box. The, the main focus on, uh, on this, Mike, is let's get our kids back to school because it's overwhelmingly known and the facts are there that it will be detrimental if we don't. So we have to have will and imagination. And if we have will and imagination, we can make this happen at every local level. Okay, we're now joined by a candidate for Washington Lieutenant Governor Ann Davison Sattler from Seattle, who has two, two school age children of her own. Ann, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thanks for having me, Mike. Okay, well, thanks for coming. I know you, you're uh, heavily booked tonight. You're very popular. Um, I understand that you might have a question or two for Dr. Garcia about his emerging, we'll call it reopening strategy. I do. Hi, Dr. Garcia. Good to see you. Good to see you, Anne. Yeah, I, I, 
I'm glad I'm on the other side of the trenches of this remote learning for right now. And it's quote unquote summer. Uh, so I don't have the, the mom guilt that my kids aren't daily uh, learning something. Um, but we have, you have talked about scientific reports and we've seen some that are highlighting the impact uh, on low income and on development disabled students if schools don't open this fall. Um, one issue I'm particularly thinking about is childhood obesity, right? Like there are issues that, that if we don't have kids being active, you know, we're going to see an, an increase in that. But, but how will you address uh, those, those who are impacted like that in your strategy specifically for the, those who, the children who are low income and developmentally disabled? Because we really need to have those kids uh, back in school. Right. Um, you're, you hit it right on, on the money there. They, you know, people that live in low income uh, households that have children with low income uh, uh, economics um, depend on on lunch and uh, depend on that feeding that the, that the school usually does, depend on that exercise that, 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 that the school usually uh, brings to them. So it's been now, now well written in many, many, many journals that the impact on low income families is worse and has been worse in the spring while closing schools. I was curious about the second part of your question because I just spoke with a teacher that has children with special needs. And sometimes these children with special needs cannot be divided into under 10 and above 10. These children with special, special needs are all ages in her classroom and she needs to be close to them. She cannot social distance for reading and math and and some of these kids need that human touch on the shoulder uh, to develop correctly. And we need to play, uh, pay really close attention to that population and find even further solutions for them and pay them special interest because they do need the extra help and how are we gonna resolve it? So the answer is not to give up. The answer is to, hey, let's sit at the table and find a solution now knowing that this special group needs extra attention and extra precaution and extra things, what are we going to do about those? And that was such a great question. Uh, thank you for asking it. Um, you get to ask another one if you have one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we're all sitting here as candidates not yet elected to office and I just you know, wondered what part do you see us playing to help ensure that kids do get back to school this fall? I mean, it's obviously very personal, personable to me uh, with my elementary age kids uh, and wanting to see their mental health uh, improved. It's been a difficult time not having them in school for their own reasons, not, not talking just about mine, but uh, so what can we do? What, what are some of your ideas as candidates that we can do to make sure this happens? Well, and we could represent the parents, right? We have uh, a lot of organizations that represent everybody else. Let's represent the, the parents and be boisterous and run strategies like this that give the power to the local schools, to the local districts, mm -hmm. to bring communities together. We can do that. We, you know, I've, I've seen you uh, give a speech or two, so I know that you can do that, and, and I certainly can as well. And we need to be boisterous to, to defend those parents on both sides, parents that are afraid and parents that want the kids to go back to school. And, and uh, Anne was a um, play defender, if I get this right, uh, in college, uh, in soccer at Baylor. <laughs> at Baylor. So I didn't know you knew my defend. position. <laughs> she knows how to defend. I've looked it up now. I have uh, and not a soccer. Um, and do you want to answer that question? I mean, we're the three of us are, are candidates for election this fall, but we're not we're not in office. Uh, and uh, you know, we need these kids back in school this fall. Um, what, what do you think uh, that you can do, or what's your your role in all this as a candidate who's not yet been elected? I'm sure you will be elected, but uh, you won't take office till January. I do. I do agree with Dr. Garcia that we have to be strong advocates for those uh, who feel voiceless, 
right, who feel uh, maybe contempt or disdain from the current representation, uh, for those who feel like they, they just don't have any place where they can be heard. Sometimes just the act of being heard by someone uh, actually goes a long way. And I do think it is time to be innovative and think outside of the box and not be part of the, the political baggage who's, that have been the box. And, and think we've thought of education in kind of this you know, uh, vertical delivery of education and, and maybe there's a different way we need to turn it on its head and really think of things uh, that are, are different. It is a way to create an educational system that provides more than maybe the old one actually provided. Uh, and maybe we can actually do it in a, in a less expensive way uh, that is actually more targeted and strategic for the students. Uh, so we have great contributing adults uh, in the next decade or two. Great, and any other uh, last words or last questions? Oh, no, I don't think so, because I think I would have too many. I, I'm just glad that there's no Zoom class going on uh, other than this one right now. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> OK, well, thank you again, uh, Anne, and good luck in your election. Uh, and Dave, thanks for having me on. Running, running for yes, thank, thank you, Anne, and, and please read the whole um, strategy. I think it's uh, very detailed. So not enough to cover here, but I would love you to give me some feedback and email me and say, hey, how about this or that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, Dr. Garcia, you're going to get a lot of feedback, I think, mostly positive on this plan. Um, and, uh, and thank you again for joining us. Now yes. we're joined by Catherine, who is a teacher in the Tri-Cities. She pulled together a group of teachers at private and public schools to talk with Dr. Garcia about his strategy. Catherine, can you tell us a little bit about the conversation and what you learned? First off, are you with us, Catherine? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, so as you said, uh, I was asked by the campaign to pull together um, a group of local teachers, which I was able to do in the Tri-Cities area because the campaign really wanted to get their thoughts on your education proposal and hear their voices about uh, and their thoughts and feelings about what opening up in person in the fall. And it was a really great conversation, I will say. And I can go to some of those points if you. Yeah, if you could um, just maybe summarize for us some of the things that maybe you learned or you thought the group learned and and then if, um, if you have a question or two, I know you spent a bunch of time on this with Dr. Garcia, but I'm sure um, those watching would be interested to hear what, what questions you have. So first off, what did you learn? And if you have any, any questions you'd like other people to learn from? Well, I, I learned from the teachers that, you know, many of them, they care so deeply about their students, which you already addressed. And uh, they want to do what's best for them. But uh, a lot of times they struggle with, um, the district's not always telling them exactly what's going on and having a good plan and follow through with that as well, which we talked about um, ways that you could help them with that. Um, and they just, but the main thing is having a plan. And I think you, you addressed it being at the district levels, which would be very helpful to teachers here. But also um, a thing that was just addressed as well as a lot of the teachers who were uh, available for the meeting last night were actually special education teachers and reading specialists who really need to be in person. And they know that, but they, they have a lot of fears because many of them are uh, you know, parents themselves. And so along those lines, it's just, uh, and you've addressed this already, so I feel a little bit silly asking a question, but what are you gonna do to support the teachers and their feelings so that they feel like they have a voice in all of this and feel as prepared as possible uh, should we do and hopefully we'll do um, in-person schooling this fall? Well, the teachers have to be a major part of the decision. Teachers are the ones that know the everyday goings on in the classroom. The teachers are the ones that spend extra money from their own pocket to buy things when the school district doesn't have the money to give them, even though it was promised. So all these things are, are, are true and the teachers have to be the center point in making all these decisions because they know how their students are going to be, uh, what the classrooms are like. For example, uh, one of the teachers that we spoke with last night said, you know, in my classroom, there are no windows. 
we would feel safer if there was a window and there was breeze and there was air coming in and out. So we could feel safer against this virus. These are things that are low hanging fruit. These are things that we can resolve easily. So when we start sitting at the table is what I'm excited about to find all these things and say, wow, look what we could come up with. Um, so that's why the strategy is, is coming out. And, and uh, I hope everybody uh, takes heart to it. I think that this is a strategy, a strategy that could not only help our districts here, but that could help districts all over America. Uh, I think that is very scientific fact-based. So people see it with their own eyes in black and white that, hey, our children need to go back to school. They are not the ones transmitting the virus and concentrate on the vulnerable population that we may infect and make sure that they are safe. Dr. Garcia, let me uh, just ask a follow-up. Um, what were your takeaways from that, that meeting with uh, teachers in the Tri-Cities? Any other kind of top of mind things? That teachers are 600 times more important than we could ever think. <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, what I said about them, um, right now is is the truth they know what's going on every day and then they could come up with situations that we can't think about and this is why the local level control is so important uh, catherine thank you for joining us and for all the great work you're doing um, we as we said at the beginning of the show we uh, we have time for a few questions that have come in we've received many questions but um, my wife, Camille, has been monitoring the questions, um, and I'll just say, Dr. Garcia, I looked at them briefly, but um, I'm not sure if you're ready to answer them. So this is live TV. Uh, you want a question, you're going to get questions. So Sure, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll just say my wife uh, was a very active member of the PTSA when our kids were in public school and also helped raise money for Issaquah schools. It's a passion of hers. Our kids now are headed to graduate school, but, but we remember how important uh, public schools are for the development of our uh, children. And uh, this is a topic that's personal for her as well. So I'm going to slide over here and she can ask you these questions. Absolutely. Hi. Hi, Camille. How are you? We have a couple of questions for Dr. Okay. Garcia. The first is about helping families with young children. And it's from RG, who's watching on Facebook. Okay. And the question is, how can we assist hardworking parents who want to work and provide for their children but can't afford the monthly cost of daycare. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And in the data that we saw uh, that we propelled into doing this strategy showed us that most parents are working. And that's why we need kids in school. Uh, school provides a safe haven for our children to develop correctly, for our children to have human interaction, uh, not only to learn, but to exercise, uh, to learn a good work ethic. And I don't wanna go into my education uh, plans here, but um, certainly is so important that that's how we help, right? Bringing community partnerships into the school system to find better solutions. When we do that, when we bring Boys and Girls Club, when we bring the YMCA, when we bring churches and other places of, of uh, faith, these partners bring answers that the school system hasn't thought of. Like Ann said, we need to think outside the box, especially for parents that need our help. So how can we as a community help those parents? How can we as a community make sure that those children are taken care of? So it becomes a community picture instead of just a school mandating the same thing. Thank you. Love the focus on community. And then we have one other question. This is from Mark. He sent it in on email and it's about charter schools. And he asks, are you happy with charter school progress so far? No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> That's the short answer. Um, we certainly uh, need more charter schools. Um, we need more choices 
for our children. And I think that uh, charter schools is one of the ways to go. Um, we have several options. Uh, of course, we want to in increase how we view public education in the state and how proud we are of it. So we have a program for that. But yes, charter schools is one of the avenues to acquire that better engagement in education for our communities. Great. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. And thank you to RG and Mark for writing in questions. We appreciate it. I'm sure that when this gets put on our website, a lot of people will have more questions. So I thank you for the time. Yes, uh, thank you, Camille, for asking those great, great questions. And Dr. Garcia, um, we're we're almost out of time. There's there's literally no time limit, but uh, we try to limit these shows to about 45 minutes. Um, so, do you have anything you'd like to say in closing to everyone who's watching tonight? Well, in short, uh, getting our children back to school is a must. This is heavily backed by the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is heavily backed by all the journals that I have read. And as a parent, I feel that we're getting behind. And I feel that this is not a partisan issue. This is um, a bipartisan uh, supported issue because I think all the parents out there feel the same. We need to get our kids back to school for their own health, for their own morbidity and mortality rates to go down. We have done horribly in the spring, closing our schools and increasing that morbidity and mortality rates of depression and suicide and obesity. And I, I could talk two hours about this and just explain how, how incredibly important it is to get back to school. Here's a strategy that is not a mandate Here's a strategy that comes to the local level and encourages everybody uniting, teachers, parents, administrators, community leaders, and finding solutions that are outside the box. So let's do it together. I think we can. Well, thank you, Dr. Raul Garcia, candidate for governor. Um, we look forward to seeing your strategy as it evolves, as I'm sure it will, as you talk to more people and maybe it'll even emerge as more of a plan, but um, you've got a lot of great ideas there. And I think it's, it's the foundation for something really special. And I know from talking to um, my friends who have kids in school, they are desperate to see their kids back in school so they can continue their uh, progress and learning. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Garcia, for, for joining us uh, tonight and good luck. Uh, the primaries next week, good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You too. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let me just let me just say in closing, um, what a great discussion on such an important topic, the future of our children. I attended public school in Redmond and Kirkland, and my two sons went to public school in the Issaquah School District. We know what a difference education can make on young lives. With the encouragement of my teachers from an early age, I became a very good student and the first in my family to go to college. And I was so lucky to go to Stanford on a full financial aid scholarship. It's so important that we get our kids, all of them, back in school as soon and as safely as we can. Thank you for joining us tonight. You have your ballots. I hope you will consider voting for me as your next attorney general. To learn more about our campaign, please go to my website at www.mikevasca.com. Good night. <laughs>